I think where I would start out, uh, there's no way you're going to absorb this entire report today. But let me do the best I can to summarize it. Going to the executive summary, it tells you how we got involved in this, and it's because we were designated as a representative of the miners. While this was a non-union mine, the, rep the miners there had a right under federal law to designate someone to represent them in the area of health and safety, and they chose the United Mine Workers. I want to mention something that's a terrible flaw in the law uh, right this minute, since I just mentioned the designation of someone to represent you. The miners who survived this were able to designate the union to represent them. Ironically, the 29 miners that passed away and for some time were underground and no one knew exactly what was their status was, they did not have that ability. The law does not grant to the families of victims a right to designate someone to represent them in an investigation. Surely Congress can see that this is a mistake. Surely Republicans and Democrats alike can say family members should be able to have a spokesperson, a representative at the table to speak for them and understand what's going on in these investigations. While we're on the subject of a miners' representative, we went underground every single day of this investigation, but one place we didn't go was to hear the witnesses testify. The federal government and the state government decided that the miners' representative should not hear the testimony of the witnesses. 300 people testified. We know what 25 of those people said because those testimonies have been released to the public. Now, that's another flaw that we would call on Congress to rectify, call on MSHA to rectify, and call on the state to rectify. How can you have a representative of the miners designated by the miners not being privy to what's being said by the witnesses? So the federal government and the state government have much more information at their disposal than anyone else. I suggest to everyone in the sound of my voice that the people who had the most invested in this were these families. They had the most invested in this. They lost somebody here. And they were treated as second-class citizens. And quite frankly, that's the way families are always treated in these investigations. Everyone in here knows that Joe Maine is a dear friend of mine, and he heads MSHA. And I think that Joe is the best pick that's ever been made to head MSHA. But that doesn't mean the UMWA is always going to agree with everything that happens there. We believe that these witnesses should have been made to testify in front of the Miners' representative. And quite frankly, we believe that this hearing should have been conducted in a public manner. I want to remind everybody in this room that we sued EPSHA to try to force this hearing, this investigation, to be made public, and it was not. That is wrong, and that's a mistake, and we need to rectify it as we move forward. Since we're on the subject of investigations, uh, let's be uh, uh, frank with ourselves at this point. The only two entities that were involved in this investigation that did not have something invested in it with respect to some possible involvement was the independent investigation by the governor, uh, originally appointed by Governor Manchin and uh, continued by the governor, current governor. And I applaud the work of David McAteer. We find absolutely zero fault with his investigation. We think that he did a great job with respect to what he determined. But let's go another step. Part of the process for protecting miners is that, A, coal companies are supposed to obey the law. They're supposed to do that. <clears throat> there are laws that say that. There are federal laws that say that and state laws that say that, and if they comply with those laws and live by those laws, we won't be in another room like this. But the truth of the matter is that didn't happen this time and it never happens whenever there's an explosion. That's why you have explosions. That's why you have fatalities. People violate the law. That's how you get in these rooms and talk about these things. But the law also requires MSHA and the state to make sure that people who want to violate the law or will violate the law are forced to comply. So the federal government had a role here to make certain 
that Massey Energy or any other company that might be violating the law was brought in line. And they have the tools at their disposal to see that that happens. Same with the state. Now, as we get to the point where we are today, who did the investigation of this fatality, these fatalities, this tragedy? Well, the very agencies that were charged with enforcing the law, the federal and state, are now the ones conducting the investigation. And I'm not suggesting anyone has done anything wrong at all here. But I think it's time to come to grips with the fact the appearance of this is not good for any of us in the mining industry, whether we're in the union or whether we're in management. We need independent investigations of all of these tragedies, particularly when there's more than one person killed at a time here, because the appearance of this is not what it should be. And this would eliminate any consideration by family members or the public itself as to how this investigation was conducted. Ironically, the federal agencies know what was said in, these, in the testimony of all these 275 individuals, and the state knows, but we don't know, and none of the families know. And we are told to wait to see what this information uh, tells us. So we think that that's a brutal flaw in the system. I want to read one particular section here and then I'm going to work off of that because I think this tells pretty much the entire story, if I might. And this is on the very first page on the right-hand side of the executive summary. The path of the explosion aided by poor ventilation, ineffective water sprays, excessive, excessive accumulations of float coal dust, and inadequate rock dusting sealed these miners' fate. You should know that this didn't get to this position in a week. Never got there in two weeks. Quite frankly, this was years in the making. All you have to do is take the statistics. All you have to do is look at the facts. And these will be the facts that you'll find. We backed up about 15 months because you had to have a starting point and ending point. But this company was cited over and over and over and over and over and over again. If there was ever a mine being uh, flagged for closure, this was it. The first person who should have shut this mine down was Don Blankenship. That's the first person that should have done it because he was the CEO. The board of Massey Energy should have said to Don Blankenship, if you're not going to close this mine down, we're directing you to go down and close this mine. They didn't do it. And let's face it, it defies belief. It would defy belief and common sense to think that this board and Don Blankenship didn't know everything that was going on in this coal mine. So the question is posed to all of us as we sit here today, if a CEO and his board of directors and everyone working for him knows that a mine is in this kind of condition, a mine that could explode at any time, what is their responsibility? And what is the penalty for failing to meet those responsibilities? Well, we uh, have pretty strong language and recommendations here, and I think it's something that I should point out to you. And we call this pretty much uh, industrial homicide. Now, there is no such thing in the West Virginia law, nor is there something in the Virginia law where Massey's home offices were located that would define something called an industrial homicide. But let me just read from our report, talking about Massey Energy. Theirs is not a guilt of omission, but rather, based on the facts publicly available, the union believes that Mass Massey Energy and its management were on notice. They knew they were on notice of a recklessly tolerated mining conditions that were so egregious that the resulting disaster con constituted a massive slaughter in the nature of industrial homicide. And we believe that they should be held accountable for the death of each of these 29 uh, miners. Well, that's pretty strong. Uh, and I want to point something out, if I might, as we talk about this. For less than one penny, 
for less than one penny per ton, they could have rock dusted this mine and made it safe for less than one penny per ton. The evidence is they never rock dusted this to the standard it should have been. They had a rock duster that didn't work. And they had two men assigned to it that they continued to take off of it and put somewhere else. That was intentional. I just priced the cost of rock duster for where it came in here. You can buy a rock duster for $10,000. You can buy a state-of-the-art rock duster for about $400,000. Compared to the price of a long wall machine that's about $50 million, you wonder, well, why wouldn't someone, when they have a rock duster that doesn't work, send somebody to the nearest place, order it online, go and buy it, haul it back to the mines and use it? Well, I think the answer is that's really simple. They didn't care. They didn't care if the mine was rock dust, that was not a priority. It was not a priority. Ventilation. Long, long history here of horrendous ventilation problems. Reversing the air. Stoppings out, holes and stoppings. 40, I think 42 or four, was it 41 or 40, what's the number? 41 or 42 sets of doors. What's that? Well, you can use what they call doors to direct the air, but that's, those are generally along the track, and every time somebody comes along in a track mountain vehicle, you've got to open the doors, and the ventilation gets disrupted. There's not another single coal mine in the United States of America with this many doors in it. This is the only mine of this size that MSHA and the state has allowed uh, this many doors to be utilized for ventilation purposes. This should not be tolerated, should not have happened, I blame Massey. I think MSHA should have denied this ventilation plan, and I think the state should have denied this ventilation plan. We believe that collectively as a union. Let's talk about intimidation for a moment. We all know the history of, of this company, but we had a foreman here who basically said, I'm a concern for my men, a foreman who said, I'm concerned for my men. I don't think we should go up on this section. And this foreman, who is now a victim, who has now perished, who died in this explosion, was said, if you can't go up there, get your bucket, come outside and go home. And basically, either you do it or you're fired. Most places across this country, most coal mines, if you express a concern for your safety, someone acts upon that. And in the most instances, if you express a concern for your safety, you have a right to ask for a federal inspector, a state inspector, if there's a disagreement. Not here. You either do it or you go home. You either do it or you go home. And I just want to follow up on one more point about this explosion, if I might. Most people who are not familiar with mining, they say, well, if we could just find the ignition source, we've solved this whole thing. Well, that's not true. It's absolutely not true. The reason it isn't, we believe that the long wall striking rock in this mine caused a uh, friction, ignition, that then set off a pocket of methane that then set off a horrible explosion. Now you say, well, gee, that's just terrible, and it is. But it shouldn't have happened, even with the ignition. There are, have, since 1983, there have been over 1,800 ignitions in coal mines in the United States of America by either the sheer or the continuous miner at the face on conventional sections, one of the two, 1,800 of them. And this is how many fatalities that caused, none. The only exception to that was Upper Big Branch. The only exception to that was Upper Big Branch. Why? Ventilation didn't work. Water sprays didn't work. Dust allowed to build up. And no rock dusting, or very little rock dusting. That combination led to the explosion, 
killed these 29 miners, and this took place over a long period of time, and I submit to everybody, whether you're a coal miner, or whether you're working for the federal government, state government, or you're in management, we cannot tolerate this in this business. This is a reflection on all of us, and I say to everybody that we must stop this. We cannot tolerate corporations like this running around mining coal like this. And I know some people are going to say, Cecil's trying to put people out of work. You've got two choices here, folks. And whether you're in mining or not, you've got two choices. You either bring everybody's standard up to the level that most companies operate on, or these companies up here have to come down here because you cannot have coal being mined and put into the marketplace based on the lowest common denominator with respect to health and safety. You'll not have one disaster every few years. You'll have two to three to four to five to six. I submit to you, if you can't mine coal safely, get out of the business. Now, that's a strong statement. I've also said in testimony on Capitol Hill that 95% of the industry wants to do the right thing. They want to have mine rescue teams. They want to have oxygen in place. They want to have evacuation plans. They don't want anybody hurt. They don't want anybody killed. What do you do with the 5%? You make the 5% do what's right, or they've got to get out of this business and let somebody else come in. There will be some of you who will say, well, the union just doesn't like Massey. I say to you, Massey doesn't exist anymore. They're gone. They don't exist. And the son will say, well, you don't like Don Blankenship. Don Blankenship is gone. And I want to point out to you, the top officials of this corporation, when asked to testify, took the Fifth Amendment. And I want to draw a, an irony for you here, if I might. Isn't it ironic that for less than a penny a ton, we could have saved 29 lives? But we paid the top executives of Massey, we didn't, but the company did, $200 million as they went out the door. Doesn't it seem like they got rewarded for failure? Doesn't it seem like they got rewarded for this tragedy? What kind of country are we living in here when that's the way we operate? Failure gets you a bonus. Tragedy gets you a bonus. There's no one in this room can believe that's right. There just can't be anybody in this room, and for that matter, anywhere in this country, who believes that's fair, that that's right. All these miners wanted to do was make a living for their families. That's all they wanted. And all they expected was for somebody to keep them safe when they went to work. Well, that didn't happen, did it? Never happened. Now, what do we do with people at the corporate level? There's some people believe that if you're a corporate officer, you're above everything. Well, you're above the law. Do you realize if this had happened outside the coal industry, out on the street somewhere, that people have been negligent to this degree and someone had been killed, they went to jail. But because they were drawing a paycheck, people look at this like, these corporations are providing the job here. We want jobs, but we want safe jobs, and we want to be able to go to work and want to kiss our wives goodbye in the morning, hug our children, and see them in the evening. And please excuse us for that demand. If it sounds like I'm a little bitter or angry about this, I think you Everybody should be a little bitter and angry about this. Coal miners are human beings. The one thing that just infuriates me, when coal miners are nothing but a statistic. How many got killed this year? Oh. Well, I want to say to you that every one of these miners that, that died at Massey, they were good fathers, they were good sons, probably coached low league ball probably were pillars of the community, probably were, uh, people might have even been pastors, deacons in their church, well thought of the PTA. They had lives worth remembering. And I think when they become this statistics, and I want to challenge one other thing. When people suggest to me, 
Well, you know coal mining is dangerous and these things are going to happen. Yes, I know coal mining is dangerous and no, I don't know that these things have to happen because they don't. They just happen to happen where people don't do what they're supposed to do. They just happen to happen when the law is being violated. They just happen to happen when people look the other way. But I submit to you we can mine coal in this country. I submit to you uh, that we can mine coal uh, safely. And I submit to you that it can still be a pillar of our economy here in West Virginia or wherever else we want to mine coal. But we should not as a society allow for the mining of coal in this manner.